Look at the person next to you and say, don't forget where you came from. And if you have forgotten, the holidays are coming up. You're surely to be reminded at some point in your journeys hanging out with some family and friends that you haven't hung out with in a long time. Um, listen, if you're a dude in here, make sure you get signed up for the summit. Um, you're like, man, it's still 2023. I know, but it's in March. How many, how many already in Christmas? Shame on you. We ain't even <laughs> ate turkey yet. Y'all talking about Christmas. Like y'all, buy, y'all, y'all are already there. So make sure you don't bypass Thanksgiving. But we are already thinking about Christmas. Some of you, how many of you are already trying to decide your New Year's resolution? You're like trying to get ahead of that, like forward think. What, what am I going to, how am I, New Year, New Me. Who's, who's so tired of that? Okay, please, everybody be tired of that. Just, just continue the growth. But I'm mentioning the summit because it is in March. It's like the second weekend in March. And so um, it's, we're going to entitle this summit The Gospel of Masculinity. Um, the good news about masculinity and the fact that the world needs more of it, not less of it. So if you haven't signed up, go ahead and sign up. Um, there'll be stuff um, going out between now and March. Have some really great speakers. One's a surprise speaker that we can't announce yet, but I'm hoping we get finalization on it quickly. So we're going to answer some questions in November because we are headed into a time where we spend a lot of time or at least more time than usual with friends and family that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, and we're gonna hit a little bit around marriage. So here's some questions we're gonna try to answer in November. Um, what has happened to the family? How many of the families eroding quickly? Um, what are the appropriate male and female roles in a marriage? Who wants to know that and who doesn't want to know that? Who does not care? Anybody? Okay, so you're like, if you mentioned submission, I'm kicking you in the teeth. I'd be like, okay. <laughs> Um, what is the responsibility of the children in the home? Who wants to know that? Every parent should say, yes, please. Okay. What should child education look like? So we're going to have Benet and Brianna take um, the platform and communicate to you guys what it should look like. That's going to happen next week. So don't miss next week. And then what happens when you get married concerning the family you came from? Like how do you, what's this whole leave and cleave it thing? Not leave it to beaver, but leave and cleave. Like, what's this supposed to look like? And then is family of choice a real thing? So, lots of stuff we're going to cover. And because, um, mostly because family's kind of super important. It it makes up the society, the community that you live in. And when the family is strong, um, the communities are strong. And when the family is weak, the communities are weak. And when communities are weak, so goes every single thing else. And so... The Bible is pretty instructive on marriage, family, children. Like it's, it's, it's pretty, it's almost one of those things you can study and find almost every single answer to every single family problem that you have. And we just don't take it very serious as, as, as in large. And we argue with the design. We say, well, that was a long time ago, so that's irrelevant to now. And I'm going to argue that scripture is true no matter what decade it's in. That, that it's actually that when God started this whole thing off, he, he said some words and he said them because they were going to be really important in 2023. And the more that you get away from those words, you try to design it on your own, the worse it's going to get, not the better. We've done a lot of things as a society, as a world, in the name of progress that actually has hurt us more than it's helped us. Um, in, in the name of we have a better idea, and we're pushing God out. So we're going to try to get back to that as much as we can. How many of you like history? How many of you don't care? You can, you can be vocal. The history people were vocal. You can be like, I don't care. Who doesn't care about history? Well, I'm going to bore you for the next three minutes. <laughs> Everybody else in here who likes history is going to be dialed in. I will challenge you with this, though. The reason you study history is so you don't repeat it. Um, and I don't know why we can't learn from that. Like, how many of you have a past? Okay, everybody raise your hand. You didn't just osmos into this existence this very second. Okay, how many of you have a past? How many, wouldn't it be awesome if you could, like, look at it and stop repeating the same mistakes? Wouldn't that be great? That's kind of the idea. And I don't know why as a world we can't do that. We can't just look back over history and go, wow, you really got it wrong right there. We're not doing that again. But it's like we just keep repeating it every 50 to 75 years and thinking, oh, every generation thinks this. I'm smarter than... How many of you were teenagers and you were smarter than your parents? And then you became a parent and you were like, 
man, they were kind of intelligent. How many of you are now communicating to your children the same stuff that was communicated to you and it frustrates you? Like, shoot, I'm eating my words. Okay, so um, something happened between 1870 and 1946 known as the Industrial Age. Am I say Industrial Age? It was a super pivotal point in the history of the entire world, but specifically the, in America. Prior to this, people, by and large, lived in what is known as joint family homes or property. All that means is this traditional male and female roles were common. Children have chores. Somebody say amen. amen. Children had chores that contribute to family life, and we all work together for the whole. When the industrial age happened, all of those people from those environments began to move to cities or towns where factories were that promised them greater pay and greater housing, which was actually not true. If you look in the industrial age, the work environments were terrible, the housing was terrible, um, they just got sold a lie, but it began the first, the very first erosion of the family because fathers were no longer the main teacher of his children public school was, mothers began to work outside the home, children were often left to care for themselves. This is where the term latchkey kids actually started. Um, and the family as a whole from values, traditions, and unity began to break down. In the 1920s, get this, the teenager mindset became a thing. I mean, no teenager wasn't even a word to like 36. Like you weren't a teenager, you know what you were? Grown. And every teenager's like, what do they say? What does every teenager say? When you tell them to do something, I'm grown. I know what I'm doing. Well, that actually used to be reality. And you know how they proved they were grown? They got a job. And they were typically, typically married by 17. Who can imagine your current 17-year-old married? And go, no, please, Lord. I have a 19-year-old married, so I'm, I'm close. There they are. Okay. <laughs> But how many, just, let's just not go back too far. How many of you can imagine you, and if some of you were, that's cool, but you married at 17? You're like, oh, no, that would not be a great choice. How many remember who you were dating at 17 and you're super thankful that they left you? <laughs> All right, so there, probably the 20s, if you were between the ages of 14 and 17, you were working and very much considered an adult. The word teenager was used in 1936, but it was coined in an article from the New York Times called a Teenage Bill of Rights, which was released and out outlined a set of rights that teens should have following World War II, which primarily, number one, was the right to have fun. Anybody remember Twisted Sister? Okay, awesome. During the 20s, traditional family values struggled in light of the focus on fun and partying as drinking and jazz dancing began to be elevated in speakeasies. From 1930 to 1950, what was going on primarily was World War II. From 39 to 45, most if not all men were away from home fighting. Women had to go into factories and get jobs. And children found themselves for the first time in the booming industry of organized daycare. For the first time, children were raised from the earliest developmental stage by someone else and not family members. Is anybody, can, you, can you now see like the, it's going down. It's going downhill over course of time. During the 50s, as American life prospered, society tried to return to a more traditional and wholesome family life, but this was short-lived because the 60s came on. Who in here remembers the 60s? Or who in here was in the 60s, but you don't remember the 60s? Anybody? There's some people that actually raised their hand. Look around the room. I said, I said you were in the 60s, but you don't remember. Someone went, well, yeah, I don't know. I know I was alive, but I have no recollection except for the acid dreams. Anybody know what an acid dream is? Raise your hand if you know what an acid dream is. Yeah, you're not racist. Thank you so much for being honest, okay? So from 1960 to present, America is now making up 70% of all the fatherless homes in the world. For the first time, there was a problem called motherless homes. Then we had child homelessness. That's children living on the street out of marriage pregnancies, abortion, normalization of homosexual lifestyle, gender confusion, toxic masculinity, and feminism, and the list continues, and the family has never been more shattered than it is right now. But it started in 1870. The reason I bring this up is because I want you to understand that you have an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he's not interested in immediate results. He's in it for the long haul, and he will slow fade your life, and he'll be good with it because he knows you're an eternal being, not a today being. And we have to wake up. 
we have to begin to take our responsibilities as men and women very serious, as parents very serious, and as children extremely serious. And we cannot hope that the system changes and adheres to what we value. It's not going to happen. It's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse. But you can decide inside of your home for the values to be restored and to live in a way that's honoring toward God. So we're going to start all the way back in the beginning. I'm going to say in the beginning. People get tired of like Genesis, but I'm telling you, this is like the purest form you can go to to look at what the plan was. So you have to go, you've got to go way back to Genesis 2. We're going to be in verse 7 through 24. Our theme verse is 24 for today. If you have your Bibles, turn there. I'm actually going to read 7, skip, and then read 15 through 18, skip, and then read 20 through 24. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Who's aware of this verse? Who has ever heard this verse at this church at any given time? Okay, we're going to say this over and over again because we exist to build, create, help people become kingdom men, women, and families. The only way that you can do that in most ways is to go back to the beginning and see what, what is God's design and what is God's instruction. And this is not about what we're comfortable with. This is not about what society says. This is what God says. And I'm telling you, if you do what God says, your marriage will be awesome. Your family will be great. You will leave a legacy that you actually want to leave. And if we had enough people do this simultaneously, I do believe the problems in the world would start to go away. It's just we have pockets of it throughout history. The 50s took a shot at it, and they did it for about eight years. It just wasn't enough. You know why? Because there's not multiple generations in eight years. You have to do it for multiple generations and for it to cause the results. Every time gap I gave you, the problem lasted multiple generations, and therefore there was always not enough time for recovery. I would love to see from 2023 to, I don't know, 2057, people just get it right for multiple generations. That's if we last this long. Jesus may come back. I don't know. <clears throat> the, uh, verse 20. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Read this one more time because this is our focus. Verse 4, today. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is an indispensable blueprint for marriage that because of our Western tradition, we typically get wrong all the time. But think about this. There were no mom or dad for Adam and Eve to leave. You ever thought about that? There's a command given to people that can't follow it. Hey, because this is how it happened, from here on out forever and ever, amen, a man will leave his mother and father and be clung, glued to, stuck to his wife because they're one flesh. The reason this command is given when it couldn't be followed by Adam and Eve is because God is giving an eternal command to every marriage that comes after this. And if a married couple fails to understand this and follow this, according to what Genesis 2.24 says, they're going to have problems. Now, what does this mean? It, doesn't, it probably doesn't mean what you think, but what it specifically means in the original language is this phrase. We actually walk out from under the authority of our parents and are now responsible for our own selves and our own families. 
That's what it means. When you get married, you are now following God in your personal relationship through Jesus, and you are now responsible for you, and you're responsible for the family that God has allowed you to have. So important is this command that Jesus restates it in Matthew 19. A man shall leave his father and mother. Countless, countless. We're, we are marriage coaches. And we coach people that are marriages all the time. We're also pastors, which means we've counseled you in your marriages sometimes. I want to tell you the number three problem. The first two problems is money and sex, okay, which is real easy to fix. Budget your money, have sex. End of story. You don't have to pay me for that. You don't have to send me an email. I just solved 90% of your problems because you fuss over money and you fuss over sex. Okay, it's a little bit more in detail than that. I don't, this is not the sex conversation, but that's the first two. The third is parental involvement in a marriage, a.k.a. lack of boundaries. I'm still mama's boy. I'm still daddy's girl. And if you continue to act like that, you're going to have more marital... Pro- now we got three things fighting against us that we have seen cause more divorces than anything. Actually, it causes more divorces than an affair. I've seen people come out of affairs like healed and whole, but when you have money issues, sex issues, and parental involvement issues, it's almost impossible to overcome that until you decide to follow what God's word says. But now listen, all the way back, I said that, hey, kids actually used to live in a parent's home or live on the same property. So is this like, is that not leaving and cleaving? It actually doesn't involve that because little as 90 years ago, that's how it happened. We, we would build something and your kids would benefit from what you're building. That's called a legacy and an inheritance. And we're actually trying really hard to restore that out at Legacy Ranch in Mount Hope, Alabama. And people look at us like, y'all are crazy. I would not have my grown kids living with me. I'm just telling you, you're missing out. But we're not forsaking this command because all of our children understand I am not the spiritual authority of your spouse. B'nai is not the spiritual, I, I, don't, I don't have, listen, I, I set Will down. I said, listen, when you get married, now she's your wife. She's no longer my little girl. I will not interfere in your spiritual authority of, of your household. Said the same thing to my daughter in loves. That's not my position. My responsibility is to raise them where they understand that. My responsibility is to build something that they benefit from so I can leave a legacy and inheritance, but it's not to live their life for them. So if you decide to do this, is it difficult? Well, heck yeah. You, you got three fa- households living in a house or on a piece of property. You know what happens there? Everybody say conflict. But I'm telling you, you, you grow more and closer through conflict than you do living separated and can ignore everything. That's why you don't want to go to Thanksgiving, because now we can't ignore it. Uncle Dan's going to show up a pint in to George Dickel, and I don't know what I'm going to do with that. And I, but I got to go. How many, how many have already said that? We got to go. Do you want to go? Well, heck no, I don't want to go. Well, then we need, we need to figure out the boundary that would be good, but you, in order to do that, you have to have a conversation. And some of you, like we talk about the word conflict and conversation, you get diarrhea. You're like, oh my gosh, they, they might not like me. They already don't like you. <laughs> you, you understand that, right? And you already don't like them. It's mutual. I don't like you. You don't like me. Let's just talk about it so we can like get this elephant in the room. How I many of you going to somebody's house and there's a big old pink elephant in the room that everybody's ignoring? What would it be like to have the conversation about the elephant? It actually would bring more peace, not less. But you're living in chaos because you're not following this. A man shall leave his father and mother. And look, it might include physically leaving a home, but the Hebrew term means abandon, forsake, and to leave behind. It does not mean that we cut all ties with our parents because the Bible's pretty explicit on the fact that we honor our parents in Proverbs 30. And check this, we care for them in their old age in Mark and 1 Timothy. You know, there was a time when daycare was not a thing. You relied on family members to take care of your kids if you had to go do something. And um, retirement homes used to not be a thing. 
It used to be that, hey, we live on property and we're putting grandma in the White House on the backside of nowhere and we'll make sure that she's okay because that's our, that's our responsibility. We're going to take care of her. But I'm, I'm telling you, starting in 1870 and because people don't follow this command, we're just going to put grandma in a home and hope she does okay. And we'll visit her every Sunday. Now listen, if your grandma's in a home, I'm not digging on you. What I'm saying is, is you're going to be old one day. And do you want to be set aside? I've already told my kids, I am with you. you I, I am letting you in my home. I built a big enough, I bought a big enough house. We all can live together. So guess what I'm not doing? I am not going in a retirement home. I will pitch a fit if you take me down there. Come on. They will tell you, come get him. Because we stuck Joshua in a daycare and they kicked him out three times for biting people. When I get 90, you put me in a home, I'm biting somebody. <laughs> and all my kids know that is not a joke. They're like, he will straight bite somebody. <laughs> so uh, when, before you're married, your strongest emotional bonds should be, and oftentimes are, your parents. But once you get married, you, you no longer look for emotional fulfillment in your relationship with your parent. It's now become the one flesh, which is why it uses the term cleave to, hold fast to, or be joined to, which means to be stuck to, welded to, or glued to. So when you decide to get married, you become glued to this person. And the design is for you guys to grow together and know each other better than your parents did. That, that emotional um, dependency is gone. It's not that I don't have emotional connection with my kids now, but they should not be emotionally dependent on me. They should be interdependent and have intimacy with their spouse. That's what the term means. I'm no longer under dad's authority, mom's influence. I'm no longer dependent on them. I've be, we've become our own family unit. That, that has to happen, and as it does it, you're going to have a ton of marital problems. So practically, we're going to flesh this out. What does it look like? The first thing it looks like is, I've already said it, number one, it means you must take up your responsibilities and you are the authority for your family. You're the guard. Now, we're going to talk more about that in week three, because remember, week two is B'nai and Brianna. And in week three, we're going to talk about roles and responsibilities once we get married. What does that look like? What is, what is the masculine and the feminine roles and responsibilities? What are the kids' responsibilities? What should this thing look like? So number two, it means this. Our spouse is our best friends and knows us better than anybody. So practically, if you have a best friend, like you're a guy and you have a male best friend, you should not have a female best friend. That's a bad idea. You have a male best friend, and the male best friend knows more about you than your wife does, that's a recipe for disaster. And vice versa. Benet knows all of my secrets. Benet knows all of my struggles. Uh, the church talks about accountability partners all the time. We think the best accountability partner you can have is your wife or your husband. Because I promise you, if you struggle with a sin, and you can and should tell your wife, it is like... The, the devil loses all hold almost instantaneously. There is something, listen, guys, nobody can pray for you like your spouse can. Listen, your buddy, listen, your buddy loves you. Your buddy's probably pretty loyal to you. But if you told him, man, I'm struggling with porn, the first thing he's going to do is go, yeah, I know, that's tough, ain't it? You know what your wife's not going to do? Anybody want to get, anybody want to just be honest about that? She is not going to go, yeah, I know, that's tough. Now listen, she should respond in compassion and empathy, but she's not going to level the playing field and understanding so much that you feel okay about your sin. And that's what most dude accountability partners do. Yeah, man, I know, I ain't, that's rough. You're male, you're always going to struggle with that. That's a lie. Just, you, just because you're male doesn't mean you're always going to struggle with looking at porn. That's a lie. You actually can have a, it's a little, it's a small word, but it's a very powerful word, victory over that. It starts with being honest. And ladies, it's not like y'all blind. 
Like we always say, guys struggle with porn. You do, you do too. And you also struggle with the temptation of the guy who's driving the really nice car, who you believe is really nice to his wife and makes a lot more money than your husband and could provide you a better life and better security and better safety. And so you look at that and go, I wonder what that's like. Imagine you were somewhere and your eyes got drawn to a man and you thought that and you went straight home and told your husband. That'd be broke. Here's what you do. You're not worried about getting fussed at. You're worried about hurting his feelings. Am I right or am I wrong? I don't want, man, it was just a thought. I'm going to hurt his feelings. Listen, he, he is created to shoulder that. And if he's not, meaning this, if he's, if he's not capable of doing it right now, he needs to man up and understand his responsibility. And you need to be open with him and tell him so that he can create safety for you, lay his hands on you and pray for you. And I'm telling you, that stuff will be falling off of you like nobody's business. But we don't understand it because we don't know what this means. And we create these outside relationships to fulfill ourselves when God designed it that I've got one. This is one flesh. We're to fulfill ourselves in him and then each other. Now, I said in him first. And then each other. Because the fulfillment that we experience between each other is an overflow of the fulfillment we receive from God. I do not worship B'nai. You should not worship your spouse. It will crush them. They are not designed to be a God. There's only one God. But they are designed to be loved and served. Um, so don't keep secrets from each other. We don't tell all the details of our marital problems with people who don't align with our core values or beliefs. What does that mean? Don't don't seek marriage advice from people who have a worse marriage than yours. Okay, like if you're like, man, we're pretty good. We should probably go ask them. I mean, they're struggling a little bit, but they're older than us. Well, listen, if they're older than you and they're struggling worse than you, that means they have not learned it. Okay, they, they are like, I don't know where they are or what they're thinking, but don't ask them their, their advice. That's not smart. Look at your neighbor that's not smart. Okay. And if you are going to confide in a friend, you need to be super careful about it and you need to let your spouse know first. There are times that I'm struggling with something and I'm offloading that onto Benet. Well, I'm, I'm 6'4", a little over 200, and when I speak to her, just a little, <laughs> a little north, <laughs> and I speak to her because of my spiritual position and my actual physical size, there's a weight that comes with that. She has the right to say, babe, I'm going to pray for you, but you need to go vent to Dan. You need to go vent to Wes. You need to go vent to somebody who understands because that's a lot of weight for me. Now listen, there have been times that she has talked to me and I have no idea what she's saying. <laughs> she has talked in every circle on the planet. And I'm really trying to dial it. Any guy know what I'm talking Like I'm... I'm not thinking about something else. I'm really dialed in, but I'm just not following. I'm like, could you say that one more time? She'll say it again. I'm like, yeah, you need to call Pastor Lisa because I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lay hands on you. I am your man, but I have no idea what you're saying. And she'll get on the, she'll be 45 minutes on the, on the phone. With Pastor Lisa come off there smiling. Everything's fine. Like, you need anything? No, I'm great. And I've heard the conversation. I still don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> No idea where the, where the relief came from. So that has to happen, but it needs to happen not with permission. That's not what I'm saying. Ladies, you don't have to ask permission. I'm not asking, but it needs to be a mutual agreement on, yep, that's the person you should go tell. Because sometimes you have friends that your spouse discerns they're not really good for you. And so you want to be open about that. Okay? I am so out of my notes. Let's go to number three. Does everybody have one and two? If you're taking notes and you don't have one and two, tell me now. Don't send me an email later. Like, right, is everybody good? You got one and two? How many of you don't care? You're not writing it down? All right. Number three. <laughs> it means family of choice takes precedence over family of origin. I'm read that one more time. It means family of choice takes precedence over family of origin. Family of origin just means the people you were born into, you have their last name. Family of choice means the people I choose to do life with and consider family. This is, this is evident through all of the Bible. Jesus says this in more ways than one. I'm not going to go like deep into it, but this is difficult for Western tradition because, especially in the South, 
It's like once family, always family. Listen, just, just because somebody has your last name or has your former last name doesn't give them to right to bring their dysfunction into your now new family. That is not a guarantee. And you get to decide. But once you leave and cleave, responsibility, authority, it's us. And it's not us against the world. Don't take on that because what you'll do is you'll isolate and elevate all your problems. It's us and we have been asked by God to do a certain thing. Now we choose, if I say choose, who we do life with in the context of family to include family gatherings around holidays. What determines this? Some of the ways this is determined, I'll give you the list, is religion, morals, core values, and family culture. Family culture is important because they can tell you, yes, we're Christians. Yes, we value this. And they are crazy. Have you ever been to your Christian families get together and go, if y'all, if y'all are Christian, I'm not really sure. Just because you have an American flag tattooed on your body does not mean you're a Christ follower. Okay? I know we, we, that's what we think. So you have to this is hard. This is hard. Can you send Shelly the email? You have to judge. The Bible says don't judge. Listen, the Bible says don't condemn and judge somebody to hell. Because you don't, but it does say for us to judge what? Each other by our what? By our fruit. So there is a call to judge. And if you're, just because somebody has either your former last name or your current last name, doesn't give them a right. And if you're judging them appropriately, and here's what you're judging them to, do I want to allow them to have access to my children or give them access to my children to perpetuate the dysfunction that I was in? If the answer is no, you can't just ignore them. Back to said conversation. That's what most people do. They just stop going around. Stop attending. And they call you and they go, man, I missed you. Why didn't you come? Oh, we were busy. You were lying. You were at home watching the game. You didn't want to go because they're dysfunctional. And you know they're dysfunctional. Why not just have the conversation before you decide and give them a chance? Say, look, I'm done. If we show up and you're halfway into George Dickel, we're going home. We just can't be, I'm not going to be around that. That's unhealthy for you. That's unhealthy for us. Be sober for like four hours. When we leave, get tanked up. That's on you. But don't do that in front of my kids. Now listen, if you go when he's tanked up, you round your little posse up and you go home. Or you start having it at your house. And you announce to everybody what the culture is going to be when they show up. And it's not going to be craziness and Aunt so-and-so and aunt so-and-so is not going to talk about cousin so-and-so and gossip about this one and, and, and like wrap it all up in and bless your heart. We're praying for you. No, you're not. You're just using Lord's language to gossip about somebody to make the whole family terrible. Most of us allow the most dysfunctional person in our family to dictate the culture of the holiday. Now, is that smart? Well, how powerful would it be if just all the family got together and said, look, 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 you can, you can come over sober or you can not come over. That's up to you. We're not doing this anymore. Guys, I can't express to you how okay that is. That does not make you a mean person. That does not make you a bad Christian. What that makes you is taking serious your responsibility and your authority of the family God entrusted you to. And we have to start, listen, most, most people in your life act the way they act because you allow it. And listen, they might, get, they might legit get free if you just looked at them and said, stop. Well, nobody's ever said that before. I've been doing this with this. This is what I do. Yeah, we're not doing that no more. Oh, okay, I guess. That does happen. People just look at you and go, okay. And they stop getting tanked up all the time. They stop smoking crack. They stop looking at stuff. They stop telling inappropriate jokes. They stop touching people inappropriately. They stop hugging people in weird ways. They stop talking gossip. How many got the uncle that just hugs you? We're like, stop hugging me like that. How many have the weird aunt that hugs you real front tight? You're like, don't boob me. <laughs> you know, it's a term, right? It's, it's actually a term in church, if you want to know, know the truth. If you're a greeter, you're taught how to hug people. Stop, but I, you did not, you, listen, if this is you on Sunday, come here. You're like, hey. <laughs> and that's not your spouse? Don't do that. It's 
especially, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, if you're new here, here's heads up. If you come in on me like that, hey, how you doing? Come in like you want to hug me. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Stiff arm, football works. You want to get back? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So look, come in and say, so good to see you. A little side hug, that's good. Get off me. All right. So, thank you, babe. There's nothing wrong. He ain't be doing that. Family get together. It's like, well, that's family. Uncle Steve's weird. Stop letting him hug you like that. Is this just way too honest? I'm not talking about you. I love you. <laughs> I can't believe you just pointed at Steve. <laughs> oh my Lord. You can't, you can't just be going. <laughs> oh, geez. I need a list of names that nobody has in here. <laughs> no. Number four, last one. <laughs> Leaving and cleaving as one flesh is a reality in the supernatural already, but it is a choice in the natural to make real. When you get married, it's already in the supernatural. That's how God sees it. But for us, it's a choice to actualize in the natural. Like we have to choose it. Couples must make every effort to solve problems and make decisions together apart from the pressure of parents and others, praying with each other in every situation and considering each other's preferences as they negotiate mutually agreed upon solutions in conjunction with their core values. It does not mean we can't seek advice. It does not mean from parents on both sides. It does not mean from friends or mentors. But what it does mean is at the end of the day, it's on us. And we are responsible for the decision. I have seen this, I'm not saying anybody does this, but I've seen where couples ask their parents repeatedly, what, just tell us what to do, really because they don't want to live with the consequences of their own decision. They'd rather blame their parents if it goes bad. That's an unhealthy, unscriptural dependence on parents. Parents demanding continued obedience or emotional dependence are running the risk of damaging their child's marriage. When one spouse continues to rely emotionally on a parent rather than the spouse, an unbiblical imbalance occurs and tragedy is not far behind. So to leave and cleave just means, hey, it's on us. I'm one flesh with you, you're one flesh with me. We have to take our responsibilities serious. We have to take our role serious, our authority serious. And we're not getting that from our parents anymore. They're on a different journey than us. And now we're going to make this happen as kingdom as we possibly can. You might move out. You might not. But you have to understand this is us. And make sure that you guard that in every way if, if you want to be married till death do us part. Because the top three are money, sex, and parental involvement. Told you how to fix the first two. And I just told you how to fix the third. But look, do me a favor. Don't just push people out of your life without a conversation. Don't just ignore somebody. At least give them the opportunity to adjust. They may not change, but they probably will adjust. But if that adjustment is made, Celebrate that, celebrate them, and continue. If, if they refuse to make the adjustment, then continue to put in boundaries to guard your home, your spouse, and your children. Deal? Deal.